Welcome to Denton's Tales of the Viking Age. And this time, I'll be looking at Norse women at sea. You know, when one thinks of Viking ships, or more correctly, perhaps, Norse ships, yeah, something, uh, something like this. Fearsome dragon head on the prow, shields down the side, uh, and so forth. The idea of women sailing on them wouldn't be the first thing that might come to mind. Indeed, many people, I'm sure, would assume that it was only men who ever went to sea in the famous dragon ships. Well, when those ships went raiding, well, that, that would generally have been the case, though, though not always. But the long ships were not the only type of North ship. There were trading and cargo vessels as well, ships that didn't have fearsome dragon or sea serpent heads on them, nor carry heavily armed men ready for battle. Even the long ships, designed as they were principally for war, would have carried women, and children too on occasions, when families accompanied the warriors, especially if any form of long-term stay abroad or founding a settlement was intended. And women would have travelled on cargo ships as merchants, since we know from items found in female graves, uh, weighing scales for example, that women were merchants and traders, and of course they would have obviously gone to sea from time to time, even if only on coastal trading voyages. So we know that Norse women frequently accompanied the men on trading and exploratory sea voyages, and obviously, as I've said, on those where settlement was the objective, as well as on combative ones, such as when the great heathen army landed in England during the 9th century AD, and women and children followed the army, something we know conclusively from archaeological excavations at Viking campsites from those times. Clearly, Norse women at sea during the Viking Age were quite a common occurrence, something that is often overlooked uh, even in quite detailed documentaries. Nor were women always only just passengers on the ships. Oh no, there were, there were cases of women themselves commanding their own ships, and even being Viking raiders sometimes. So, let us take a look at some specific named women who took to the sea during the so-called Viking Age. There is an early 12th century Irish text, which translates as the War of the Irish with the Foreigners, which mentions a Viking fleet landing in Ireland in the late 10th century, led by a woman who they don't name, but refer to as the Red Maiden. And she is portrayed as a very dangerous leader, one of the most dangerous Viking leaders, in fact, and one of the most unpleasant. And that her eventual death was regarded by the Irish as one of their most important victories, which gives you an idea of how they rated her. It's questionable how accurate that account is as to the actual details of her death, which do appear to have been, well, somewhat fantasized to quite an extent. And in fact, the details given about the Battle of Clontarf in the same work aren't overly accurate. But the fact that she's mentioned in itself is significant. After all, why would the Irish invent a female Viking chief? There is no suggestion in the text that the Vikings are any worse for having a woman among them. Uh, there was no extra propaganda made of it. Oh look, those fiends have a woman leading them. No, you know, female warriors had existed in Ireland in previous centuries, so from that point of view to the Irish, there was nothing special about it. They were, they were quite used to women fighting. Nothing really would have led them to invent a female Viking simply for the sake of it. So I think the fact that she's mentioned indicates her actual existence, a woman commanding her own fleet. A similar nickname is used for another female Viking, uh, mentioned by the historian Saxo Grammaticus in his Gesta Donorum, The History of the Danes. And that is a Norwegian woman named Rusa, daughter of the king of Telemark, who gathered a Viking fleet after her father was overthrown by Danish king Omund, attacking Danish shipping in revenge. She carried out raids on the coast of Denmark, as well as on Iceland, Britain, and Ireland, gaining a fearsome reputation as a bloodthirsty individual who took no prisoners, gaining herself the name the Red Woman in the process, and having nothing to do with the Red Woman in Game of Thrones. Being captured by her was definitely a life-changing event, since you lost your life fairly quickly, and in a suitably bloodthirsty manner. Could she also be the Red Maiden of Ireland? nickname is similar, but Rusa was killed in Scandinavia, betrayed by her own brother, in fact, who killed her by holding her braids as his men beat her to death with oars, after he was bribed by King Omen, while the Red Maiden was said to have died in Ireland in combat with the Irish. They could, of course, be one and the same, both tales based on the same person. Rusa did, after all, raid Ireland. Or they could be two different women, 
we can't be certain, but it's more likely that the two names are merely a coincidence. Had she led an attack on Ireland and subsequently died there, I'm sure Saxo would have mentioned it. So, and you know, in Rusa's case, one could say with a brother like that, who needed enemies? Continuing on with seafaring women, we mustn't forget the remarkable Order Ketilstot here, nicknamed the Deep Thinker, and usually called Ord, though she was also known as Unner or Un, a remarkable woman in the 9th century, remembered and honoured in Iceland even to this day as one of the great early Icelanders, having been prominent in many aspects of life in that country, and totally reversed gender roles in a very male-dominated age. She was the daughter of a Norwegian chieftain named Ketil Flatnose, and she married Olaf the White, the Norse king of Dyflin in Ireland, or Dublin as it is today, giving birth to a son, Thorsten Olafsson, later known as Thorsten the Red. After Olaf was killed, she and Thorsten moved to the Hebrides, where Thorsten married and had a number of children, and he began conquering parts of Scotland. However, he was betrayed by his own followers and killed. When she heard of his death, Aud had her slaves build her a ship in secret, building it out in the woods at Cave Ness in Scotland, where she happened to be at the time, fearful that the local Picts would discover how few men she had and possibly attack her, they having little love for her son, obviously. Now that ship was not a dragon ship, the fearsome longships being principally warships. Aud's vessel was a knorr, which is a, a type of large merchant ship, wider and slower than the longship. A typical knorr was over 50 feet long and able to carry a very considerable tonnage of cargo, and intended for long sea voyages. It didn't have a ferocious dragon head on the prow, nor a bank of oars and shields hung along the side as with a warship, relying on just the sail and a couple of oars for manoeuvring in the harbour. Once it was completed, she took family members and friends, plus some 20 men, to crew the ship, as well as a number of slaves, men captured during raids around the British Isles. And she captained her ship first to Orkney, where she married off one of her granddaughters, sailed on to the Faroe Islands, and then to Iceland, where she claimed a large area of land as her own. Now, Aud was obviously a, a kind-hearted woman. She gave the slaves their freedom once she arrived in Iceland, making them what were called freed folk no longer owned, though not having quite the status of other men, and she gifted them land so they could farm and support themselves, something she had absolutely no obligation to do. She was quite entitled to keep them as thralls, and she did the same for her crew. She became a prominent, influential, and highly respected figure in Iceland, the first great matriarch of Norse nobility in that country, being known for her intelligence, as her nickname, I suppose, would indicate, and having an honoured place in Icelandic society far greater than most women could expect in those days, though Norse women did in general enjoy a greater status in many ways than women in other lands usually did, but Aud went beyond that. Then there was Freudis Eriksdottir, daughter of the famous Viking Erik the Red, and sister of Leif Eriksson, named for the goddess Freya. On that note, one usually hears her name pronounced Freydis, and the goddess as Freya, but that's the modern pronunciation in the Scandinavian languages. But in Old Norse a thousand years ago, her name was Freudis, just as the goddess was Freya. Anyway, having got that out of the way, to continue. She travelled to the New World 500 years before Columbus, as the famous rhyme puts it, sailed the ocean blue in 1492, and of course didn't discover America, since he never got anywhere near it. Following the successful expeditions to the New World by her brother Leif and Thorfinn Karlsefni, which I'll come to in a moment, Freudis persuaded two men named Helgi and Finbogi to accompany her to Vinland, the seemingly wonderful land discovered by her famous brother, what was once thought to be Newfoundland, but it's almost certain now that it was actually New Brunswick. To, you know, divert slightly off the main theme for a moment, for years, it was believed that Leif Eriksson had landed and established some kind of a, a brief settlement in Newfoundland. And indeed, a Norse settlement was later discovered at La Anse au Medeau on the northern tip of Newfoundland. And later on, a further site was discovered to the south at Point Ross. However, something about that didn't quite add up. Leif's glowing description of his Vinland but it simply didn't fit Newfoundland in the slightest. He talked of rivers teeming with salmon, of wild grapes growing in abundance, and natives who constructed their canoes from animal hides. Yeah, but see, there weren't any salmon-filled rivers in Newfoundland. Grapes don't grow there, and there weren't any animal-skin canoe-building natives. So it was generally assumed that Leif had 
just made it up. He obviously went somewhere, but he added to the tale a bit. It was a great story to tell sitting around the fire on a winter night. Oh, you should have seen it, my friends. Rivers filled with salmon. You could walk across the river and just, just pick them up. Oh, the land covered in wild grapes as far as one could see. Pick them and eat them as you walk along. And curious people who use the skins of animals to make little boats. It was amazing you should have been there. Yes, Leif. Yes, we, we believe you. Good old Leif. But recently, new evidence completely changed things. And it cleared Leif of the accusations that he'd been, well, a wee bit economical with the truth. An archaeologist carrying out excavations at Lanso Meadow made an amazing discovery. She found grape nuts in a Norse midden heap. Grape nuts. So, grape nuts, you say? Well, you see, grape nuts don't grow in Newfoundland. No, the furthest point north in Canada that you can find them is New Brunswick, which is nearly 600 miles to the southwest. So, if they had grape nuts at Lance on the Doe, they must have brought them from New Brunswick. The grape nuts, after all, didn't bring themselves there, go ashore and jump into a Norse rubbish pile. But the, the clincher is the fact that wild grapes grow in New Brunswick. There are salmon in the rivers, and the natives there used to make their canoes from animal skins. So there you have it. Leif did indeed discover the Vinland as he described it, not just where everyone thought it was. He mentioned stopping at various places on the way, and Lanso Meadow was probably one of them. But the grape nuts combined with the perfect match of New Brunswick with his description shows that he travelled at least 600 miles further than was previously thought, and indeed possibly even further than that. Anyway... To get back to Freudus. Freudus travelled to Vinland, having obtained her brother's agreement that she could use any buildings he'd constructed there. Another account has her going with Thorfinn's expedition, but it's more likely that she travelled on her own, or at least simply followed him, separating from his group when they arrived. And eventually she seems to have definitely been on her own with her own group, given rather drastic events that occurred later, which Thorfinn doesn't seem to have known anything about, and most certainly would have had she been anywhere near his group. She established herself in Vinland, but things didn't go smoothly. Though early relations between the Norse and the natives had been friendly, misunderstandings arose, and the natives launched an attack on the settlers who were having a hard time of it, almost certainly outnumbered, and retreating in the face of the attackers, when Freudus, who was eight months pregnant at the time, ran out and shouted at the retreating Norsemen, Why run you away from such worthless creatures, stout men that ye are? When it seems to me likely you might slaughter them like so many cattle. Let me but have a weapon, I think I could fight better than any of you. They ignored her, but she picked up a sword one of the men had dropped, and she charged at the natives, exposing her breast and beating the sword against her chest as she let out a ferocious battle cry, driving the natives off, taken aback as they were by the strange sight of a bare-breasted pregnant woman brandishing a sword and screaming something they didn't understand, and obviously intending to fight. Probably not a sight you really would want coming towards you. That's hardly a surprising incident given the less-than-meekly-feminine personality of Freudus. No, no, she was not a timid little woman by a very long way. During the year she spent in the New World, relations between her and Helgi and Finnbogi deteriorated severely, until she decided to get rid of them. They were in a separate camp, and Freudus claimed that they'd attacked her, so her men went and killed the two men and their followers while they slept. All very well and good. That took care of Helgi and Finnbogi. However... She was furious when she discovered the five women who were with Helgi's group had been spared. Her followers hadn't killed the men's wives as well, not, well, not wanting to harm the women they considered innocent of anything. That didn't suit Freudus one bit. She wanted everyone dead. So she got her axe and went and killed the five women herself, giving them her own personal touch, if you like. You didn't mess with Freudus, Eric Oh, no. When they returned to Greenland, she just said the others had well, they decided to remain in Vinland. Which, of course, was partly true. They had remained in Vinland, though they didn't have a great deal of choice about it. But word of what had happened eventually reached Leif, and he wasn't exactly happy about it, confirming the details by torturing some of her men. But he decided to ignore it and not seek punishment for her. She was his sister, after all. Though I'm sure her father, the notoriously quick-tempered and bloodthirsty Eric, would probably have said something along the lines of, Ah, that's my girl. <laughs> that's the way to do it, girl. <laughs> yes, that would have been Eric. 
And now we come to a woman whose travels far exceeded those of any other woman of the so-called Viking Age, and also or otherwise, or probably of the entire Middle Ages as well. A woman who sailed across the North Atlantic eight times in an open boat that most people today would be reluctant to sail in across a very large lake, let alone an ocean crossing. Travelling from Iceland to Greenland, getting shipwrecked in the process, then attempted to sail to Vinland, but the voyage failed and she was forced to return to Greenland, then back to Iceland. Once more she sailed successfully, this time to Vinland, settling there for a while and giving birth to the first European to be born in the New World before sailing to Norway and then back once more to Iceland. Later she travelled to Norway and Denmark and then went to Rome on foot as a pilgrim before returning to Iceland. That's quite a lot of travelling. Not surprisingly, her travels resulted in her being known as Gudrid Vidfolle, or Gudrid the Far Travelled. Her real name was Gudrid Thorbjörnadottir, and she was born in the year 980 AD in Laugabrekka, a form that lay on the Snæfellsnes Peninsula on the western coast of Iceland, the daughter of a chieftain named Fjörbjörn of Laugabrekka, hence her surname, which, which is a patronymic, not, not a family name, meaning Thorbjörn's daughter just as Freudis was Eric's daughter and Aud was Ketil's daughter. She is thought to have died in 1050 AD at the considerable age for those days of 70. Now Gudrid grew up in the last decades of what we might call the old Iceland, shall we say. The Iceland where the gods of Asgard reigned supreme, Odin, Thor and Freya to name but a few. Pagan rituals were practiced as they had been for centuries before the Norse had even discovered Iceland. And the early settlers were, of course, pagans. But towards the end of the 9th century, new ideas were beginning to spread. A new faith that had its origins in distant Palestine. And that faith reached out into the Atlantic to Iceland. This would become known as the Kristnitaka, the taking of Christianity. Something that would drastically change Icelandic society. The first Christian missionaries arrived in Iceland around the year 980 AD, the year Gudrid was born, but they met with little success and departed without having had any real influence on the country, nor were they mistreated or uh, injured or threatened in, in any way by the pagans, contrary to what would frequently happen to pagans at the hands of the Christians, one has to say. But in 995 AD, Olaf Tryggvason became king of Norway. And this charming gentleman, very charming gentleman, began a highly aggressive campaign to convert to Christianity not only his own country, which almost brought about a civil war between pagans and Christians, but also Norse territories overseas, such as the Faroe Islands and, of course, Iceland. He dispatched one Stefnir Thorgelsen to Iceland with orders to help the people see the beauty of Christianity which Stefnir did with extreme violence, destroying pagan temples and images and threatening people to make them understand the Christian message of love and peace and forgiveness. But of course, since he himself showed no sign of any of those very admirable virtues, all he succeeded in doing was making himself so detested that the Icelanders declared him an outlaw and chucked him out. So next King Olaf sent a priest named Thangbrand to try more subtle methods of persuasion to show the goodness of Christianity as opposed to Stefania's decidedly un-Christian efforts, which worked better. It certainly worked better than the previous violent approach, and that's hardly surprising, but it still had little real effect. And he only managed to bring a small number of people into the new faith, even using nice methods as he did. Now that, that really pissed off King Olaf, who was rather easily pissed off. He liked to get his own way, and he had no scruples about how he got it. So he cut off all trade links with Iceland, blocking Norwegian ports to Icelandic ships, and he detained Icelanders, some of them relatives of prominent citizens back home who happened to be living in Norway, taking them as hostages and threatening to kill them in retaliation for non-conversion to the Christian ideals of love, peace, joy, etc., etc. Noble ideals, which he seems to have had a rather vague concept of himself. He certainly never followed any of them. Iceland faced a dilemma accept the new faith and restore the trade they really needed in order to survive or reject it and risk a civil war, as well as the trading restrictions that would bring the country to ruin. Being pagan wasn't just a problem with King Olaf either, since the church forbade Christians to trade with pagans anyway, which made trade with other countries difficult as it was, or even impossible, depending on how far those countries were prepared to look the other way over the church's ban. So in the year 1000 AD, 
the ruling families of Iceland, not wanting a civil war over the matter if they could help it, decided to put it to the Althing, the annual gathering at which important matters are discussed, laws enacted, and so on. Thorgeir Thorkelson, the law speaker of the Althing, and himself a pagan, said he would consider the matter if all parties agreed to abide by his decision. Everyone accepted that, and after a day and a night of meditation and contemplation under a fair blanket, he decided that Iceland would become a Christian country. Just like that. Instant conversion. The greatest conversion to another faith anywhere, anytime in history. He stipulated, however, that pagan worship in private would continue, and old customs such as eating horse meat, a Germanic custom outlawed by Pope Gregory III in 732 AD, and the exposure of unwanted infants to the elements as a way of keeping the population down would be permitted. Thorgir then threw all his pagan idols into a waterfall that became known as the Godafoss, the Waterfall of the Gods. Thus, the conflicts that marked the Christianization of Norway were avoided. Once the church had full control over Iceland, however, all pagan practices, even in private, were banned. Not that the ban prevented some people from doing it anyway, however risky that might be. And pagan traditions have lingered in Iceland, even down to the present day. Now, you know, it has been suggested that trade advantages with Christian countries and keeping the peace played a greater part in the decision to adopt the new faith than any actual religious convictions. And indeed, conversion by agreeing to do so if somebody else decided it would be a good idea, you know, it's hardly a sign of genuine religious conviction. No. Also, religious fervor never rose to the extreme heights in Iceland that it did in most of Europe during the Middle Ages. So that was the new Iceland in which Gudrid came to adulthood, she too following the popular trend and becoming a Christian at some point, though she was clearly well versed in pagan ways, having been raised in that faith, as is illustrated by a fascinating account of her somewhat reluctantly performing pagan rituals while being herself a Christian. One winter night, she and her father and some companions were feasting at the home of a man named Thorkel, who was presumably a pagan, when he was visited by a seeress, a volver, named Thorbjörg, who was intending to perform pagan magic, specifically what were known as ward songs, for which she needed the women present to assist by chanting. Gudrid, however, was the only woman present who knew those magic songs, which she had learned as a girl from her foster mother, Haldis. But she wasn't happy about it, telling Thorbjörg, these are the sort of actions in which I intend to take no part, because I am a Christian woman. But her father and Thorkel managed to persuade her that performing the chants would be beneficial for the other people present, and just a bit of chanting, which she didn't even believe in anymore, wouldn't harm her Christian status. She would be helping other people, which of course was a Christian virtue. Thus reassured, Gudrid performed the pagan song with considerable skill. Everybody went home happy, and Gudrid's faith was undamaged. Her soul was obviously safe from the flames of hell. Excellent. The travelling who would make her famous began after a young man named Einar asked for her hand in marriage, but Thorbjörn really wasn't impressed with his marital credentials since his father had been a slave and he rejected him. Gudrid eventually marrying a Norwegian merchant named Thorir, but her father decided it was time to leave Iceland, which they did, accompanying Eric the Red to the newly discovered Greenland. It was not exactly a pleasant voyage, though they did set out during the summer. The weather in the North Atlantic turned bad as it frequently did. 11 of the 25 ships that had set out being lost, and those aboard the surviving vessels suffering quite severely from illness. But Gudrid and many of her group did land safely, including Thorir, though they were shipwrecked and had to be rescued from a small rocky island by Leif Eriksson, the son of Eric the Red, who took them back to his own home and invited them to stay with him for the winter. Thorir didn't recover, however, from the illness that had beset them, and he died during that winter. Gudrid then married into high circles as far as Greenland society went, marrying Thorsten Eriksson, another son of Eric the Red and the, the younger brother of Leif. Now Leif had recently explored lands to the west, including one he'd named Vinland, which sounded a yeah, pretty nice place with rivers teeming with salmon, wild grapes growing in abundance, etc. And Gudrid and Thorsten decided to travel to this wonderful Vinland themselves, and they set out to do so. However, luck was against them, and they failed they were forced to return to Greenland, where Thorsten died of an illness. Gudrid was not doing very well as far as lasting marriages went, but she tried for a third time, 
third time lucky, as they say, she made the acquaintance of one Thorfinn Karlsefni, described in the sagas as a man of good family, a merchant of repute. The name Karlsefni actually meaning a, a real man, a, a thorough man. And they were married. Now Gudrid was still fired with the idea of Vinland and its possibilities as a, as a suitable place for settlement. And after they were married, she urged Thorfinn to go to Vinland and establish a settlement there, nagging him in all probability, along with others who agreed with her. And they all spent the winter, it seems, with a voyage to Vinland as the main topic of conversation, obtaining uh, Leif Eriksson's agreement to use buildings he'd already constructed on his own voyage there. Not surprisingly, Thorfinn agreed to go, probably just to shut them all up. According to one account, he and Ord put together a group of 60 men, five women, and an assortment of suitable animals, and set sail for Vinland, thought to have been in the year 1010 AD, which they reached safely and established a settlement, as I've said, probably in what is now New Brunswick. Another account, however, says that he took three ships and 140 other people, possibly including Thrydis and her party, though we really don't know. Anyway, however they got there, they got there. They remained in the New World for some three years, during which time Gudrid gave birth to a son, who she named Snorri Thorfinnsson, he becoming the first European to be born in the New World. Not long after that, they decided to abandon the settlement, since the relation to the natives, which had been friendly to begin with, had turned sour, and so the Norse settlement was deserted. Gudrid and Thorfinn loaded up their ship with a considerable quantity of valuable goods that they had acquired, and they sailed to Norway before returning quite wealthy to Iceland. Back in Iceland, they took up residence on a prosperous farm of their own, since Gudrid's thoroughly disapproving mother-in-law wouldn't let them live in her home. And Gudrid had a second son, named Thorbjorn Thorfinnsson, after her father. But, yes, you've guessed it, Thorfinn Karlsefni followed the, by now rather, monotonous example of her previous husband and died leaving her once again a widow, though the one who had considerable property and not a little wealth by this time. You know, if, if, if I'd been a Greenlander or an Icelander looking for a wife, I wouldn't have touched Gudrid with a rowing oar. Marriage to her seemed to mean certain death. Putting a ring on that woman's finger, it, it was a curse. When her son Snorri came of age and got married, Gudrid decided she would go to Rome on a pilgrimage. So off she went, sailing first to Norway and then to Denmark, and from there going across Central Europe on foot, as was the standard practice of pilgrims, and no small journey in itself, eventually arriving in Rome, probably with very sore feet. Having fulfilled that duty of a pilgrim, she then returned to Iceland, where Snorri had built a church near her estate. She was said to have then lived in the church as a nun until her death. Gudrid was certainly a remarkable woman by any standard, and her exploits deserve our respect. Then there is the story of Herowal, a woman who, according to the sagas, was as strong as boys and turned her back on feminine things, learning swordsmanship, archery and horse riding, before dressing as a man, taking a man's name, and going vikinger. In other words, raiding, fighting and killing as she raided and pillaged, being a, a viking. But while she is probably based on a real person, her story, as related in the saga, is clearly embroidered to a considerable extent, but it's, it's still worth it's still worth a mention because, again, the, the concept of a woman doing these things is, is important. After starting her adventures, she later travels to the island where her father, a famous warrior, is buried in order to retrieve his magically gifted sword. Only she is brave enough to land on the island, her crew deserting her and taking her ships with them, hearing strange noises coming from the island, so they just bug her off and leave her there. But she goes on. Ignoring monsters that are said to lurk there, she breaks into the tomb and demands the sword from her undead father. Now, he's a bit reluctant to give it to her, because not only is this like a magic sword, but it's also cursed. Once drawn, it cannot be sheathed until it has tasted blood, and even the smallest cut from it anywhere in someone's body will be fatal. Oh, and incidentally, it will also bring tragedy to those who use it. Thank you, if I'd been terrible, I'd have left the damn sword where it was. But anyway, eventually he gives her the sword. And she leaves to have adventures as a great warrior, serving King Goodman for a time before continuing her Viking ways. Now eventually she gets tired of it. She's had enough killing and burning things and looting and whatnot. And she goes home, reverting to the role of a normal woman, marrying King Goodman's son and having children. Yes, well, I suppose all rather unlikely to have happened, but the story does have a very important message. As I said, it shows the concept of a woman doing all that was accepted. There was nothing seen as a, a strange about it. Nobody was surprised. 
that she became a Viking, had her own ship, raided things, killed people, and so forth. The idea of a woman being a Viking warrior was perfectly accepted. As to the undead part, uh, I don't really know. So we come to the end of this look at seafaring Norse women, real and legendary. The part played by women going to sea was considerable with regards to founding settlements, since a settlement without women, well, obviously that was hardly a settlement, and in following the men into battle, encouraging them and tending to the wounded, that women accompanied military expeditions is archaeologically demonstrated by things found at the Viking encampments in England, as I've said, left by the great heathen army. And in a few cases, women actually commanded their own ships, as did Rusla and Ord, or sailing in joint command with others, like Gudrid or Freudis. So, until next time, I shall say, Pavel, and bye for now.